because when I was finished with the car, I wanted to have a car that uh, would be fun to drive, would uh, certainly look nice, and uh, that I'd want to drive for years and years. Uh, people often choose uh, less expensive cars and perhaps even cars that are past their prime, but then when you're done with the conversion, you have a, an electric car that's really past its prime, and I, I didn't want that. So uh, this is, uh, I would not categorize this as a no compromises build, but um, I didn't compromise very much. I, uh, um, I chose the best components that I could afford, uh, thinking that, uh, uh, one, I, I wouldn't have to replace them, and they'd serve all the purposes that I had that I needed at the time. The, uh, um, I was able to find a, a shop that, w that wanted the engine and was willing to pull it and would pay me money for it. So I drove it down to, uh, to the shop, they took the engine out and gave me a check and I, I had it uh, brought home. And So it took about a, a year to, uh, to complete the conversion and I think it went rather well. So let's take a look under the hood and I'll, uh, I'll give you a quick tour of what, uh, what I did. So I think the first thing that you notice are the batteries. There are 31 of these batteries in the front compartment and in the back in the trunk there's another 17. So that's a total of 48. These are the Sky Energy 120 amp hour batteries, although people have found that they hold closer to 130 amp hours. And so in fact Sky en Energy is now selling them as a 130 amp hour batteries. But uh, with all 48 that makes a 160 volt pack holding a total of, uh, of 20 kilowatt hours worth of power, which uh, is quite good c relative to the weight of the batteries and uh, the amount of space that they actually take up. As you can see, I have the batteries strapped down in a very secure way. These straps go down to the, the boxes that the batteries are in and are bolted down to, to the boxes. Then the boxes themselves are bolted to the chassis. So this will keep the batteries from moving and uh, while I'm turning corners or quick stops or over bumps and certainly in the event of an accident I think they're very well secured which is important for safety purposes. Moving around to this side of the car we see the vacuum canister here it's connected to the existing brake system on the car and to a vacuum pump down located below this battery. The vacuum pump draws the vacuum down and uh, it, to help the uh, vacuum assist brakes. I have actually built the pump in a uh, box in an effort to uh, to help isolate some of, of the noise and vibration that it creates. The These pumps are notoriously loud and and offensive and I, I don't know if it's helped much but I do know that it's still loud and I don't particularly like it but it's uh, the best so solution for the problem at this time so it's what's in the car. This is the original throttle cable that was connected to the engine and I have it connected to the throttle pedal here mounted into this box. This pedal actually was in fact a pedal and it was uh, uh, right here but and it was designed to to go into the car itself but uh, I didn't feel that I could incorporate it into the pedal assembly down there uh, very well so I would have had to take the pedal assembly out and, and cut it up and then try to put it back together and I, I didn't think that it would actually uh, go together very well and I didn't think I had the room so it was better just to, uh, to put it up here so I've connected a, a swage device that I've made to it and it works quite well as I pull the, the cable it moves the pedal and, and sends the signal to the controller and is very effective now this is the reservoir for the power steering fluid. The power steering pump actually lives beneath this battery on a steel bracket that I've built. And it remains off under straight line driving. On the steering column is a proximity switch. And if I turn the, the wheel just slightly, it throws a relay which will turn the power steering pump on. And that way you can turn quite easily. One of the things I don't want, however, is for the pump to go on and off as I'm making turns, say through a parking lot. So I've incorporated into the system an off delay relay. What that does is it makes sure that the pump runs for at least 10 seconds. So 
the pump will turn on and it will remain, remain on until I've been heading straight for 10 seconds. Then it will turn off and rest until the next time I need it. In addition, over here I also have a, a very large fuse and this does exactly what you think it, it would do. It, uh, if the controller draws too much power or some other fault in the system causes too much power to go through, it will blow and hopefully protect all the electronics. Now moving over to this side, you see a large breaker. This is really just to isolate the pack from all of the electronics. So if I need to do any work in the electric bay, I can just hit that switch and it will uh, I, it will isolate the uh, the pack and and make it safe to uh, to do any work there. Now just forward of the breaker is the shunt, and this is to provide power uh, to the meter in the car, which we'll be talking about shortly. I've tried to run all the low gauge wire in the car in wiring loom just to keep things a little bit neater, and uh, I think it's a uh, Overall, as you can see, the, the, the space in, underneath the hood is very, very limited, and it was difficult portioning everything out, getting it right, but I think I've done a fairly good job. I, I've got everything to fit, which is uh, pretty good, and I've got clearance through the hood as well. So, uh, next we'll take a look at the electric bay. So this area is what I call the electric bay. Uh, this w originally held the uh, the car's ECU and the other uh, components, uh, electrical components responsible for driving the car. Uh, BMW designed this to be watertight, so when you shut the hood, it actually uh, seals against this, creating a watertight space. And uh, I decided to capitalize on that and use it for um, all the electronics for the car as well. So, so here we have the controller, and then just behind that is what's called the hairball. That is, it's essentially just a uh, computer that controls the uh, controller. Um, here is the, uh, uh, the contactor. Now the contactor is really nothing more than a, a big switch. When you turn the key, that uh, contactor turns on, providing power to the rest of the system so that it can move. Now all of this sits on top of a tray, and um, underneath that is a second tray that contains all the relays and switches that drive the various components of the car. Um, I don't like the fact that they're underneath that because if I have to get to them I actually have to take the controller out. But as you can see space was at a premium so it was really uh, uh, the only place for it. But uh, I don't really expect any of the relays to go bad. They very rarely do so in the event they do I'll, I'll, uh, I'll change it out. But uh, uh, so far, the Zilla has been just fantastic. It's just a, a great device, and, uh, and this has worked quite well. Well, I thought we'd talk for a moment about the changes that I made in the cabin. I think the first thing to point out is the meter that I've installed. This space actually was occupied by the clock in the car, but I was fortunate that once I removed the clock, this meter fit in here perfectly. So that worked out very well. This meter is it's called the Link 10, and it's made by a company called Xantrex and uh, it is no, by no means the, the best solution for EVs, but it's adequate and it was affordable so that was the one I chose. It has uh, the ability to show you the current voltage on the pack as well as how many amps that you're drawing right now and the total number of kilowatt hours that you've pulled from the pack which is very useful. Next to that you see this switch now this switch actually turns on the ceramic heater, so once I pulled the engine, the original heater core was no longer any good, so I replaced it with this ceramic heater. One of the problems that ceramic heaters have is they get very hot, and that's very good, but if you're not pushing air over it, uh, you can quite easily set your car on fire. That's not such a good thing, so what I've done to safeguard against that is I've, I've connected this switch to the fan switch when the fan is in the zero position or off, the switch has no power to it. It's dead. So I can turn it on all I want and it won't it won't turn the ceramic heater on. Once I've turned this to the uh, one position or any other for that matter, then this switch becomes active and I can turn the, the heater on and defrost the windows or warm the cabin. So that works out quite well. The last change would be the, uh, the uh, tachometer you see in the instrument cluster. The original tachometer was driven by the CAN bus or the, the ECU and it spoke a language that uh, that unfortunately the Zilla didn't uh, speak so I, I couldn't make the Zilla 
drive that original tachometer. So I was going to have to find a replacement. I was lucky enough to find online a company that, that will custom make a gauge for you so that the, the needle's the right color, the numbers are the right uh, color, and, and it even glows. When you turn the lights on at night, it glows the same color as the rest of the instrument cluster, so it looks quite nice. But more importantly, it was only one inch thick so I was able to get it into the space behind the cluster there and, and make it fit with the rest of the dials. Now, if you at first glance, you, you may not notice that it's any different. If you look closely, you'll see that it's a different dial, but I think overall it actually turned out quite nice. Well, I thought we'd take